Section 17 of Astounding Story 6, June 1930. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marty on the Central Coast of California. Astounding Stories 6, June 1930. By Charles W. Diffin. The Moon Master. Part 3. About the men was a confusion of granite rocks, thrown from the crater to provide weapons, crude and futile, for two puny earth-dwellers. The men raised great rocks in the air and threw them with all their strength. Jerry struggled with a mammoth boulder, Winslow leaping to his aid. They toppled it over to start an avalanche of devastation that swept into the oncoming monsters, and again there was respite for their aching arms, while the hunger-crazed brutes tore at the bruised bodies of their fellows. Jerry Foster looked longingly again toward the crater. Should they chance the shelter of the jungle growth? Hopeless. He knew when these monsters could crash their way through while the men were impeded at every step. The mottled, orange-green stalks as he watched them seemed to move. He dashed the sweat from his face. His hair hung matted on his forehead and passed a grimy hand across his eyes. Plainly, one of those stalks crossed a rocky, floored clearing. Was he dreaming? Was all this a dream, a mad nightmare from which he could force himself to wake? Another moved. He saw definitely a mushroom growth pass swiftly to lose itself in a neighboring clump. Dreaming? No. The screams from behind him and Winslow's hoarse yell proved the stark reality of his surroundings. The vile creatures were close. Jerry could see their fierce heads dripping with blood. He reached for his pistol, knew instantly it was useless against these mammoth brutes, and joined Winslow, who was straining desperately at another great rock. It toppled and fell. Jerry hurled himself at a heap of smaller boulders and sent them crashing as fast as he could seize them and throw. One quick look behind him showed still the impossible vision he had seen. And now there were figures, a mob of them, figures that threw off the wrappings of vegetation as they ran, cast to the ground the toadstool disguises that they held. They were caricatures of men that were swarming up the hill. He swung again in one last hopeless stand against the first horrible army. The two men poured a torrent of stones down the slope. They were useless except for delaying the advance. The beasts leaped and dodged. They were close when the rock rain increased to a deluge. Jerry was fighting in a red haze through which he saw dimly. He was aware of the hailstorm of boulders that were thick in the air. He saw vaguely the white faces and copper-clad bodies of strange men leaping about him, and he heard the wild bedlam of their shrieks as they joined in the mad battle against the common enemy. The beasts were swept off in a landslide of loose rock, all but one. Above them, on a high point of stone, it was crouching to spring. A wild human figure, its flesh white as chalk, leaped forward with a tangle of fibers. The tangle was thrown as the brute was in the air, a net spread and wrapped around the monster. It fell, clawing and tearing, to roll helplessly down the slope. The battle was won. Jerry swayed drunkenly on his feet. About him the mountains seemed whirling, where unreal figures of men with dead white skin and shining copper armor danced dizzily. He met for an instant the look from Winslow's dazed eyes. Out of the past, a picture flashed clearly. Winslow, this same Winslow, arguing that the moon might hold mystery still. He laughed thickly. And I said, it was all known. He muttered through slack lips, nothing on the moon that wasn't known. He was still laughing in a wild inebriation. As a net settled close to entangle his swaying figure and bear him helpless to the ground. He saw Winslow similarly bound, saw him lifted to the shoulders of shouting, yelling men whose stupid, pasty faces were wide-eyed with excitement. He, too, was raised into the air. They were being carried toward the crater's mouth. A fight for life in thin air does not make for clear thinking. Jerry Foster knew only that a nightmare world was whirling about him. 
that beneath him powerful shoulders supported, while the one who carried him leaped at racing speed down the slope. They went more slowly down pathways, cleared through the rank vegetation. Soft, pulpy vines from the grotesque trees brushed his face. He tried vaguely to shield himself, but his hands were bound fast. He was helpless in the entangling folds of the net. The touch of cold stone brought him to his senses. He was lying on smooth rock. They were in a clearing. He turned his head to find Winslow, but could not find him. Across the open ground were naked men, their bodies, like the others, dead white in the sun's glare. They were dragging giant stalks to earth by means of ropes. Trunks and branches, bright in their colors of yellow and orange and flaming red, were hacked to short lengths and piled on all sides. The workers, as Jerry watched, dropped their implements to race toward him. There was a press of flat, white faces above. His captors in their copper armor beat the newcomers back. The babble of chattering voices was deafening. Again he was lifted into the air. Plainly these were no weaklings he had to deal with. And again the warrior band surrounded him as the march was resumed. The milling, shrieking crowd of workers followed in an ear-splitting mob. The forest ended and the men went slowly now down smooth, rocky slopes to stop upon a wide, level expanse. Before he was placed on the ground, Jerry had a glimpse of a funnel-shaped pit, the mouth of the extinct volcano, and toward it, bound and helpless, was being carried a struggling form which he thought he recognized. Winslow, he shouted, but the bodies in their gleaming copper armor closed about him in a solid throng and cut off his view. In the sky the sun had moved slowly upward since first they landed. It slanted brightly now into the eyes of the prostrate man and made a spectacle of his twisting contortions as he tried to get his hands on his knife in its sheath at his belt. This and his pistol were under his coat, but he could not reach them. He lay panting with his exertions. One of the warriors seemed to have authority, for his arms alone of all the group were sheathed with copper circlets, and the others obeyed his orders. Jerry addressed himself to this one. He knew the words were unintelligible, but he pleaded desperately for a chance. Take this off, he said. We are friendly. Friends. Friends. He struggled to keep himself from shouting, to keep his voice under control. The other man, he said. Bring him back. And again he repeated, We are friends. He scanned his captor's faces. The pasty face above him was impassive. The eyes stared uncomprehendingly into his. Then the figure barked an order. One of the warriors swung Jerry lightly to his shoulders and started toward the pit. At its edge was a basket, a huge affair of knotted fiber ropes. Dimly, Jerry saw other baskets standing about. They were filled with the fragments of fungus. Still bound, he was placed in an empty container. Hands grasped the meshes, and he was swung out over the edge. A rope was thrown above him, and he was lowered steadily into the dark shaft. Jerry breathed a sigh of relief. This was not death. Not yet. And Winslow? Safe, perhaps, for he had traveled this same road. There was figures outlined above against the circle of light, figures that clambered like apes down swaying ropes. The light glinted and sparkled from their shining armor. His escort was still with him. The circle of light changed to a glowing ring, where only the rim was lighted. Above was the deep black of the lunar sky. Then the circle faded to a mere point as he went down into the pit. The rope basket came to rest upon a rock floor, and Jerry was lifted out. He saw plainly the figures about him, and he wondered vaguely at the light that came from the walls of the cavern. There were long lines of soft light, leading off into the dark, lines that marked plainly a labyrinth of passageways, leading in all directions. Beyond a narrow entrance was one brighter than the rest, a broad avenue that led downward still further into the depths. Here he was carried. He tried vainly to keep some mental map of their course. He would return some day. He must return, he and Winslow. 
they would escape. But the passage turned and twisted. There were many branching corridors, each with its lines of light. Jerry gave up the attempt. It was a maze of serpentine streets beyond his power to remember and recall. Before him the passage was still wider. It was opening into a great room. Jerry found himself upon the floor. He strained cruelly at the cords about his head as he twisted and turned to get a view of his surroundings. The room was a cave. Its vast vaulted ceiling sprung high above a level floor, where the figures of men, odd plaster-white figures like animated statues, were small in the distance. His eyes were drawn quickly to the brilliant glow of the farther wall. There was the bright black a basaltic formation, and in it, though he knew the impossibility, was shining the sun. Jerry blinked his eyes to look again and again. The golden circle was dazzling. It was set at a point well above the smooth floor, and up to it there led a sloping pathway of gold. It was as if they had indeed captured their god. These worshippers of the sun had captured and held it for the adoration of the groveling people. Jerry saw them upon the floor. The copper of the armored men gleamed bright in the glow from beyond as they abased themselves and crept slowly toward the light. At each side of the dazzling orb was a platform. There were figures upon it, seated figures Jerry saw, even at a distance. They were robed in vestments of the sun. Their forms gleamed gold in the light. The leader that Jerry had noted among his captors crept on in advance of his men. From among the bright figures on the platform above, one rose to extend a glowing arm. He spoke, and the tones rolled majestically back from the high vault above. The crawling man below him stopped rigidly where he was. Another word from above, and he rose slowly to his feet. He stood full in the glow of the captive sun. To be outlined in black against the brilliance beyond. Haltingly he spoke. Then, seeming to gain confidence, he launched into a torrent of words. He gestured and waved, and to Foster the sign language was plain. He saw reenacted the surprise of the warriors upon beholding these intruders, saw how they had spied upon them, using trunks and branches of the fungus as a screen saw in pantomime their own battle with the beasts, then the rush of the armed men to the rescue. Again the net was thrown, and the gesturing figure turned to point dramatically where Jerry lay bound, then pounded his armored chest with unconcealed pride. He ceased to speak, and there was utter silence in the room as the figure above crossed to stand before the golden sun. He, too, abased himself before the sign of their god, then rose to stand motionless, listening. For a breathless interval he waited before the oracle, then prostrated himself again and returned to his place. He repeated, it seemed, the command, congratulation, to judge by the ecstasy of the figure below, the warrior turned once to throw himself before the image of the sun. He repeated this again and yet again before he crept back to his fellows. The group arose and rushed swiftly toward the bound man. They brought him quickly into the presence. With scant ceremony, Jerry was unrolled from the net. He lay free and gasping upon the floor. The men scurried like mad from out of the pathway of light that shone down from the false sun. Jerry rose to his feet. The brilliance before him almost blinded, but he saw now whence it came. There was a hollow in the wall, a great parabola, deep and wide, and it was lined throughout with beaten gold. In a straight path the light was reflected from every point, every point but one, for at the far end, where the curved sides joined, was a circle of darkness. It stared like an eye, evil, portentous. Jerry nerved himself for an ordeal, unknown but eminent. The black eye glared at him unwinkingly. Before him was the pathway of light. It shone brilliantly down the sloping ramp where a floor of bright gold led up to the sun-god itself. 
The figure on the dais raised its hand. Jerry heard the words come from its lips and roll sonorously back from above. The figure waited for an answer. Jerry's hand slipped beneath his coat to rest reassuringly upon his weapons. He withdrew his hands empty and raised one toward the figure above. I do not understand your words, he said. Your language is strange. No doubt mine is as strange to you. I come as a visitor. I am friendly. He held out both hands, palms upwards. We have come, my friend and myself, on a friendly errand. He paused to look vainly about for Winslow. And you have received us as if we were wild animals. Jerry Foster of San Francisco, USA, was suddenly resentful of their treatment. His words were meaningless, but his tones were not. You have tied us, he said, bound us, dragged us before you. Is that the way you receive your guests from another world? The golden-clad figure stood in majestic silence while Jerry was speaking. It waited a moment after his outburst, then crossed again to bow low to the floodlight of gold. As before, it seemed listening to words from the black heart of the strange sun, words quite inaudible, soundless. He returned quickly and waved Jerry's attention to the place of light. The sense of a presence there in the central blackness was strong upon the waiting man. In that other life that now seemed so remote, his life on earth, Jerry had once felt the threat of a concealed intruder in the dark. He recalled it vividly now. The sensation was the same. But it was magnified. There was no denying the reality of a malign something at the heart of that golden glow. The black center of it vibrated with cold and venomous hate. It struck upon the waiting man like a physical force. His head was swimming. His thoughts refused to form. He was as if suspended in a great void, where all that was lay deep in the center of that radiant orb, and it drew him irresistibly on. Like a dazed bird held and stricken in the hypnotic gaze of a snake, Jerry took one stiff, unconscious forward step, another, and another. He strove dumbly, helplessly for realization that there was nothing in the universe but the certain thing ahead. His foot was upon the golden incline, leading to his doom. When that buried something which marks a man, the spark of divinity which sets him apart as one alone, reasserted itself. I am, he heard his own voice shouting in strangled tones, I am Jerry Foster. I am I am myself. He awoke from his stupor with a shock that set every nerve fiber quivering. For long minutes he stood silent. Then, realizing his victory and proving it to his own soul, he looked straight into the black center of the threatening sun god, and he laughed loudly and contemptuously. Then, turning and with steady stride, he walked calmly from the light. The great hall was silent with a silence that was breathless. Then pandemonium broke loose. The priests and the god had been defied, and screaming and shouts rang throughout the vast chamber to re-echo batteringly from ceiling and walls. There was tumult and confusion where the populace thronged. Even the figures above on the dais were milling about in disorder. The rippling gold of their robes made a spectacle that forced Jerry's involuntary admiration. Then one from among them sprang forward. His voice roared above the shattering din. The room was still. Another order and the guard of armed fighting men formed in a circle about the defier of their god. Jerry waited. Trouble was about due, he told himself. One hand was on his pistol, tense and ready. As the ranks stood silent and made no move to attack, Jerry Foster did a curious thing. It was not done intentionally, but Jerry Foster had nerves, and they had been under a strain. His hand went unconsciously to his pocket and extracted a cigarette. There were matches there, too, and he struck one and lighted the white cylinder. The match made a tiny flame where he flipped it. The whole room whispered and hissed with one loud gasp of amazement, but the moan that followed 
that echoed and resounded from the roof was of nothing but horror. Even the warriors drew back in trembling dismay, and before them the stranger that they had brought to the very portal of their sanctum of holies blew clouds of white smoke that eddied and whirled as they rose around his head. The effect was not lost upon Jerry, and his mind was working. Was fire unknown to these strange beings, here in the deep caverns far from the surface? Was fire a thing of terror to them? He looked back toward the wall. If they rush me, he thought, there's a good place to be. That will feel mighty comfortable at my back. He walked slowly, the smoke rising thick around his head. The copper-clad figures before him withdrew, the ranks parting to let him through. Unharmed, he reached the safety of the wall. The enemy now formed a semicircle before him. The inertia of the stricken beings on the platform was broken by his move. Again their head priest gave an order. From another side, a second detachment of armed men came on. They were carrying something. Jerry leaned forward in quivering preparedness as he saw, in the floodlight of radiance, the body of Winslow lying on the floor. Was he injured? Dead? The devastating loneliness that swept him at the sight of the still body was unnerving. He breathed a long sigh of relief as the lanky figure rose slowly to its feet. Winslow was alive. They would show these beastly, unearthly humans something yet. There was no preparation, no preliminaries. Whether Winslow could have reacted, as Jerry had, would never be known. He seemed stunned and helpless, and it was with no resisting hesitation that he began to climb to the unknown. Jerry's crouching tenseness snapped. No thought of the gun as he sprang toward the enemy between him and his friend. No, Winslow, no, he shouted as he leaped at the figures in front of him. Their strength has seemed startling to Jerry when they had carried him like a child. He had forgotten his lightness here on this unheavy world, and he had forgotten his own great strength. No panting, exhausted, beaten fighter of beasts was this that hurled himself against the ranks before him. One coppery sword flashed above his head. Its bearer was seized with two hands that picked him bodily from the floor and crashed him, a living projectile, among the others. Jerry waited for no more. There was an opening ahead, and beyond was Winslow, walking stiffly, certainly, up that damnable slope. He threw himself in giant leaps across the floor. His companion was halfway up the glittering ramp when Jerry seized him. Holding him in his arms, he leaped outward to land rolling on the floor. He was on his feet in an instant. He dragged Winslow to a standing posture. "'Wake up, man!' he was shouting. "'Winslow, wake up!' The onrushing horde was upon them while the tall man was still brushing his hand over weary eyes. And Jerry, for the moment, had the fighting to himself. No time for anything but parry and strike. He caught one white face on the jaw. The man went bodily through the air. Jerry landed again and again. His weapons were his fists, and they did fearful execution, and he knew at length that he was not alone. The long arms of the inventor tore a sword from an upraised hand. Its owner was thrown, as Jerry had thrown one previously, to catapult among its fellows. They were clear for an instant. Back to the wall, shouted Jerry. He had time and room to reach for his pistol, and he drew it quickly from its holster. They backed hastily to the protection of the stone wall. There were scores upon scores of copper-clad figures that followed them, held out of reach. With a flashing of gold, the head priest himself sprang to urge on his men. Ready, said Jerry. I wish you had a gun. Here, take this. He handed his companion a long-bladed knife, then turned to aim his pistol with steady hand at the oncoming figure in golden robes. The priest stopped for a brief scrutiny of this new menace, then screamed out an order and hurled himself into the sheltering press of men. Jerry fired into the whirl of bodies. The roar of the forty-five tore like a battery of siege guns throughout the great room. But the creatures before them were fighting now in an insane frenzy. Their bodies pressed the two men to the wall. Jerry fired again and the fall of a limp, gold-robed body gave him a thrill of delight. The inventor was holding a white body as a shield, while he thrust past it incessantly with a red blade. 
there were huddled figures before them that lay quiet or crept painfully away the body of the head priest was being carried off the dark mouth of a passage had impressed itself upon jerry he remembered it now it offered a means of escape off to your right he said work off to your right there's a hole in the wall they fought off the struggling eruption of bodies that drove at them jerry was saving his ammunition but once more he fired as a sword was falling over winslow's head he drove strongly with his left and beat at the white skulls with the butt of the gun gripped in his other hand the passage was suddenly behind them one last stand against the screaming frothing faces and they back panting into the sheltering dark jerry stopped and took winslow by the arm are you hurt he demanded the inventor was too breathless for reply nothing much he panted after a moment one got me along the cheek and you shot him just in time how about you okay was the assurance but man i've been hammered what a peach of a fight he added but now what winslow laughed mirthlessly in the dark this looks like a one-way street he said we can't go back say he demanded with sudden dim recollection i remember something of a dream a ghastly sort of thing i was i was where was i when you collared me where was i headed for something too damnable for us to imagine jerry stated emphatically they were walking as rapidly as they dared through the dark passage there were high-pitched voices from the rear from somewhere ahead came the sound of running water too damnable to imagine he repeated but we'll hunt the vile thing out if we get a chance and we'll slaughter the words ended in a startled exclamation as the ground fell beneath their feet they pitched headlong into nothingness end of part seventeen recording by marty on the central coast of california